want you to imagine that you're just about to undergo major open heart surgery and they're putting you to sleep and you're not sure if you're ever going to wake up again. And when you look up, your surgeon is standing and it looks like he's praying. Well, a famous surgeon once said that every surgeon carries within himself a small cemetery where from time to time he goes to pray. Those are some pretty haunting words. And those words really get at this paradox, this contradiction of surgery. So to do surgery, you have to hurt somebody in order to heal them. And there's a cost. There's a heavy, heavy burden. And heart surgery was the final surgical frontier. Every other organ system had been operated on and conquered, but not the heart. And why is that? The heart was a forbidden zone. In fact, there was a famous surgeon who once said at the turn of the century that anyone who attempts to operate on the human heart would lose the esteem of his colleagues. And for doctors, that's a big deal. So why is it a forbidden zone? Well, one reason is that we didn't have the techniques necessary to operate on this vital organ. There was no techniques in surgery that would allow for something like that. And also, there was this cultural significance of the heart. It was a forbidden zone because the heart, the heart is life. I mean, in every culture from the beginning of mankind, we've understood that a beating heart is life. And when the heart stops beating, it's death. In fact, that was the medical definition of death for a very long time, if your heart stops beating. Every TV show you watch, what do you do? If you think someone's dead, you feel for their pulse. No pulse, you're dead. And to do open heart surgery, we have to stop your heart. It's death. To train in heart surgery is long and it's difficult. It takes at least 10 years of long days and sleepless nights to have the privilege of doing this. And there was a surgeon that once said that the toughest thing about heart surgery is getting the chance to do it. And it's a very elite area of surgery. We take one person a year here in Calgary to train in heart surgery, and there's only about eight spots across the, the entire country to train in heart surgery. There's maybe 100 active cardiac surgeons in the entire country. So it's pretty, it's pretty elite. And what's it like to do heart surgery? What does it take to do heart surgery? It takes, what I like to say, you have to be an NFL quarterback, a chess master, and an air traffic controller all at the same time. You have to coordinate a whole team, and you got to do things right. So what's it like to actually do a heart surgery? Well, the first thing to do heart surgery is you have to get there. So we have to cut you. We have to cut right through the core. We have to cut through your breastbone. We have to take a saw and cut that bone in half. And then we're not quite there yet. There's a sac around your heart and the heart sits within that sac, and we have to cut through that sac to get to the heart. And when you do, it's incredible. When you hold that beating human heart in your hands, it's the ultimate thrill. It's such an incredible organ. It's so filled with life. The colors, the impact of this heart is incredible. It's got such a will. It just wants to keep going. And it, you know, we say that, we say people have heart. And I can see that when I do surgery, or when I hold that heart. But to do heart surgery, you have to stop the heart from beating. We have to put a clamp on the heart, we cut off its blood supply, and when you put that clamp on, the heart slowly starts to deflate, and it slowly stops beating, and you see a flat line on the monitor. And at that moment, you know you're sort of standing at the gates of that small cemetery. The burden of what you're doing is quite intense. The room stops for a second. And sometimes I think, this is the worst job in the world. Why would I take on this burden? But then at the same time, this is again a contradiction, is it's also the ultimate trust, is that someone has given me their trust to do this, which is also something very extraordinary. You know, when I speak to patients and I talk to them about all the risks and benefits of surgery and what we're gonna do, and I spend about half an hour telling them all these technical details, and they're looking at me, and I know they're not really hearing anything I'm saying, they're looking deep at me, and they're just saying to themselves, do I trust this guy? And they do, and they give me this opportunity. And I wonder, how does an ordinary guy like me get to have that kind of trust and that responsibility? It's truly extraordinary. Well, that level of trust is really interesting. There's something, there's something about cardiac surgeons and heart surgeons. They come in all shapes and sizes, ethnicities, men, women, bit different personalities. 
there's something that's common about all of them. And I've had an opportunity to train with and work with heart surgeons around the world. And I think it's this. I think this is, it's Kaizen. Now, Kaizen is a Japanese principle of continual self-improvement. It's always trying to learn from what you've done and get better and better. And I think that's the one thing that all heart surgeons have. And they have to have that. Because to take on that burden and that responsibility, to have that level of trust, you need to learn from everything that you do. So as heart surgeons, we have to be perfect. But you can't be perfect. So we chase perfection. And in the chase for perfection, we catch excellence. And excellence is what we, what we do. 99 times out of 100, we can do open heart surgery now safely, effectively. You live longer, you feel better. That's remarkable because it wasn't that long ago that heart surgery was impossible. This picture is really special to me. It's November 1944, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. This is the first blue baby operation. So babies were being born with a heart defect and they were blue because there was not enough of the oxygenated blood, the, the pink red blood was mixing with the blue blood through this defect in their heart. And there was no cure for it. There were no treatments. You could give them medicine, but they would die. And there was no hope for these little babies. Well, there's a surgeon, and his name is Alfred Blaylock. And he was experimenting in his research laboratory for many years on a way to improve the circulation. And he came up with some special techniques to do, to create a shunt in the heart. And he applied this, and this is the first operation. This is Blaylock right there, and he's standing, and his hands are deep in this baby's chest. And standing right across from him is a tall intern named Denton Cooley. It was his first week, and he was given this extraordinary opportunity to participate in this very first surgery. And what's incredible is Denton Cooley describes in his memoirs that when they took the clamp off the heart, and allowed it to start beating again, they watched this blue baby slowly turn pink. And they knew for the first time, he said, this was the dawn of heart surgery. It was possible. They knew it was possible. Well, that intern, this is him 50 years later. And that's me standing right beside him. What an extraordinary opportunity I had to go to Texas and learn from this man. And it shows you how we're one degree of separation. I'm one degree of separation from the dawn of heart surgery. That's how short, how compressed the time frame is in this specialty. It's pretty incredible. After I finished my training in Toronto and Chicago, I had this extraordinary opportunity to come to Calgary. And I wanted to create my own program. I wanted to do heart surgery and also try to advance heart surgery. I was so inspired by the history of heart surgery and I knew that I wanted to add maybe a chapter to the story of heart surgery. If not a chapter, how about a paragraph, even a sentence, something? And I was given this unique opportunity here in Calgary. And then this is the blueprint of the lab that I designed. That's right next door. This building was an empty shell 10 years ago when I came. And I was able to plan out exactly what I wanted. And that's a blueprint. That's an ordinary blueprint of a lab. There's really nothing special about that. But sometimes you can take the most ordinary thing and make it extraordinary simply by doing it with the right people. And that's what we've been able to do in my research program. We've recruited and retained some of the top students and research associates and collaborators. And we've instilled a culture of mentorship amongst all of us that's been extremely effective. And I want to tell you about some of that work that we're doing. People are born with heart defects and abnormal heart valves. There's something called bicuspid valve, where you're born with a two-flap valve instead of three. And one thing we understand, if you think about a tap, you turn a tap on, the flow comes out in a very organized way. Well, even if you put your finger over that tap, just a tiny little bit, you get chaotic flow. You get a lot of, you know, abnormal flow patterns. Well, that can cause trouble in the heart. If you think of like the Grand Canyon or something like that, over time, abnormal blood flow patterns can cause real structural problems. But we've never had a way to really see those abnormal flow patterns. We've never had a way to visualize them. Well, now we do. So we're using the most advanced imaging technology. This is called 4D flow MRI. For the first time, we can see deep within a patient's chest and map out in real space and time these flow patterns. And this is where the precision medicine comes in. Heart surgery has come a long, long way. We're now past 
trying to get patients through a surgery, now we know we can do the surgery really well. The technical parts of surgery are not that difficult. The, what's really interesting is now the challenge is who to operate on and when to operate on them. And this type of technology is going to tell us which of these patients we should operate on when and maybe when we shouldn't operate on them. And that's really critical. Another thing that's really interesting is that you know, we've really focused on trying to get patients through the surgery, trying to survive patients through heart surgery. Now we can work on some of the finer details. And one of the things that bothers patients the most is going through the breastbone. And can you imagine that the way we close the breastbone is the same way they did it in 1944. You take stainless steel wire and you wrap it around the bone and you twist tie it like a garbage bag and you hold it together until the bone heals like any broken bone. Well, that really slows people down. They don't like that. It's painful and it limits their mobility, and they're not too happy about it. So we thought, well, maybe we can still do an ordinary access to the heart, but close it in an extraordinary way. And we used a special superglue to do that. And we were the first group in the world to do this, and we took it all the way from concept to clinical trial. And it's been really exciting to watch this evolve. People have adopted this technique, and it's still being adopted, and the patients really love it. One of the things that you're most concerned about is heart attacks, and you should be, because it's the number one killer. And heart attacks are really, you develop blockages in the arteries on your heart, and you need to, your heart muscle needs a lot of oxygenated blood. It's always pumping and it's always working. When those blockages um, get severe enough, you can cause a heart attack. If the blood supply is cut off to an area of muscle for long enough, that area starts to die. And interestingly, it won't ever recover. Once the heart muscle dies, we can't fix it. We can do a lot of things, but we can't fix dead heart muscle. One of the greatest successes in heart surgery has been bypass surgery. So we can go in as surgeons and we create bypasses. We can go around those blockages, we create new blood vessels, and it's pretty incredible. We take arteries or veins from other parts of your body, and we surgically put those onto the arteries, and they're only about a millimeter or two millimeters in diameter, and we make blood flow through them around the blockage and restore blood flow. And that's a great technique. It saved many lives and it's very effective. But it's not as effective if you've already had a heart attack. And we see a lot of patients who come in and they have a heart attack and we have to do this surgery. And it's helpful, but it doesn't fix the dead muscle. So whenever I operate on these patients, I look at that area and I think, well, it's right there in front of me and I can't do anything about it. This is a whole new frontier. Well, maybe there's something we can do. So there are things called biomaterials. And biomaterials are actually biologic tissue where the cells have been removed, and what's left is the scaffolding that holds all the cells together. We once believed that the scaffolding was just a passive material. Now we know that it's rich with signaling factors and growth factors that tell cells what to do, tell cells to live or die or grow, regenerate. Well, we had access to some that came from an intestinal uh, tissue, and some tissues are more regenerative than others. So we thought, well, what if we take this intestinal tissue, the heart's not very regenerative, but what if we took this intestinal scaffolding and sewed it on the surface of the heart at the time of bypass surgery? Could we then target the heart muscle and restore its function, regenerate it? Well, we took that all the way from concept to the first human clinical trial in the world right here in Calgary. And this is a picture of one of those patches on a human heart beside one of the bypasses I created. And standing across from me in that picture is Holly. Holly was my intern, and she trained in my laboratory, and she did a PhD on this project. And this is the very first one. Well, how does it work? We spent years in the lab trying to figure this out. How could this be of any benefit at all? What's interesting is that when you have a heart attack, the cells in your heart, they're scar-producing cells, and they're told to make more, more and more scar. And you don't want scar, you want muscle. So in other words, the soil, there's something wrong with the soil. We're growing weeds in the soil and we need to grow flowers. So how do we change the soil? Well, this biomaterial can do that. What we've done is we've done studies where we've interacted human heart cells with this biomaterial and it changes those cells. They don't produce scar anymore, they actually produce new blood vessels, tiny microscopic blood vessels. So I, as a surgeon, can go in and create big blood vessels, which is good, but we also need those little micro vessels in that area of damage. And you, when you hook those together, it's incredible. You see an area where red is dead by MRI. This is some of our experiments. Six weeks later, we restored function. 
And this was, these were hearts that were defined as non-viable, meaning they're dead, they're not coming back. So the heart does have reparative signals. We need to amplify them. We need to help it along. And this may be a very simple way to do it. Holly presented this work at the American Heart Association meeting, which is one of the largest medical meetings in the world. And she won the Vivian Thomas Young Investigator Award. That was very special to me that I was able to provide an environment for Holly to be so successful. And it was very special to me as well, because 14 years earlier, I won that same award when I was at the same stage of my training. So it was pretty special. And it was also very special because of the name, Vivian Thomas. So it wasn't the Denton Cooley Award, that tall guy standing across the table. It wasn't the Blaylock Award. It wasn't named after any heart surgeon, actually. So who was Vivian Thomas? Well, let's go back to the Baltimore, that first blue baby operation. There's somebody standing behind the surgeon. And he's actually not wearing any gloves. He's kind of not really in the picture, but he's in the picture. Well, that's Vivian Thomas. And Vivian Thomas was at every blue baby operation, and he was whispering in Blaylock's ear, the surgeon, a little to the left, a little to the right. He was actually instructing him how to do it. Vivian Thomas was the laboratory technician of Blaylock. He actually came up with the techniques that allowed the first blue baby operation. And he's an African-American man at a time when not only would he, he wouldn't be treated extraordinary, he wouldn't even be treated ordinary, he'd be treated less than ordinary. African-American man at that time was allowed to be a janitor in the hospital. And here he was, pioneering open heart surgery. He eventually, um, he actually was a college dropout, never had a degree, but he was given an honorary doctorate from Johns Hopkins for his work, and he's widely recognized, and that's why that award is so very special. So when I look at this picture, to me it means a lot because these three men at this single moment in time represent the three pillars of academic medicine, research, education, and patient care. And when you take transformative research and compassionate, bold patient care and inspired, mentored education, and you nurture that like we do here in the medical school, that's why we have a medical school, for this reason. And when you take those things together, and when those three things blossom, you truly have something very extraordinary. And that's the extraordinary story of ordinary heart surgery. Thank you.